Osteobites is a weekly osteosarcoma webinar and podcast presented by MIB agents. This week, we're talking with Dr. Alex Wong, Chair of Pediatric Oncology at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital and Professor of Pediatrics at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. Our panelists are Amanda Levine of Facebook group Bone Cancer Support and Florencia Pistrito of Osteosarcoma and Ewing Support Group. I'm your host, Anne Graham. Welcome to Osteobites, everyone. We hope you have your snacks ready to crunch on because we have a really exciting session today. Um, my name is Anne Graham. I'm an osteosarcoma survivor. I started MIB Agents in 2012 with the mission to make it better for kids with osteosarcoma. Our mission continues today by providing direct patient and family support and by bringing together the physician and researcher community, and also by funding osteosarcoma-specific research. Today, we get to have one of our osteosarcoma research winners with us. Really excited about having Dr. Alex Wang talking about his osteosarcoma research. And we also, of course, have Amanda and Florencia, who are osteosarcoma patient advocates with us, as usual. Dr. Wang, would you lead by introducing yourself, please? Sure, thank you, Anne. Uh, my name is Alex Wang. I'm a professor of pediatrics uh, at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Case Western Reserve University. And I am a, a physician scientist, uh, and also a pediatric oncologist. Um, and um, uh, my research is focused on understanding how our immune system functions in disease, specifically in cancer, and, and best how to use uh, immune system as a way to fight cancer. I'm Amanda. I am the administrator of the Close Group on Facebook, and I was diagnosed with OS in 1987. And since my diagnosis of breast cancer in 2010, I have been an advocate for our families. And I speak friendly again because I was diagnosed with ALS in uh, 2018. Uh, my name is Florencia. I am the administrator of the osteosarcoma and knee wings uh, support group on, on Facebook. I had osteosarcoma in uh, 2014 and also, uh, well, I had been uh, working in, in advocating for early diagnosis in Scotland uh, to improve this for patients. Thank you, Florencia, and thank you, Amanda and Florencia, for, for doing the amazing work you do. Uh, Dr. Huang, over to you. Sure, and I'll put it on. Um, I prepared some slides to, to guide our discussion today. I was asked by Anne uh, and NIB agents to actually share uh, some of the updates on the projects that uh, that were chosen to be funded by MIB agents through the outsmarting osteosarcoma uh, competition last year. Um, and so the, the title is talking about how understanding or conditioning the immune environment uh, can be a potential effective therapy for metastatic pulmonary osteosarcoma, which as you know, uh, really is what ultimately um, uh, patients succumb to uh, and currently there's really no standard of care or good therapy for it. And um, uh, just a little bit about myself, uh, as I said, I work here at uh, Case Comprehensive Cancer Center here in Northeast Ohio in Cleveland. Uh, the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center is a unique entity that encompasses multiple institutions as a consortium institution, including Simon Cancer Center, which is part of University Hospitals, uh, and, and under which uh, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital also belong. Um, and then the activities are coordinated through school of medicine, and then uh, involving also Cleveland Clinic at Towson Cancer Center, where uh, Mateo Chuko and Dr. P. Anderson's work. So they, they literally, they are down the street from you, we can bike to each other's offices, and it's actually a great uh, community here to work in. Uh, my focus is a, uh, in tumor immunology. This is something that I've studied um, since the early 1990s. And, uh, and so really it's very exciting over the last decade or so to see how immune uh, therapies have come to the forefront uh, for, for as, a, as an alternative approach to, to solving cancer problems. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of these approaches we're trying to think about as we uh, tackle 
pulmonary osteosarcoma. And here are some photos of uh, the Czech presentations from last summer. And uh, I particularly like the one on the upper right hand corner here where we all have a little hero pose. Um, I'm not quite sure. I, I was trying to be a Spider-Man, I think. Uh, <laughs> totally working for you. <laughs> so just real quick, I mean, this, um, I think most of us, we think about osteosarcoma or any cancer for that matter um, in terms of therapeutic options. I think instinctively we think about chemotherapy, right? This is ingrained in our culture, in medical culture, in our communities. And really the history of uh, chemotherapy sort of started right around the time of World War II for the last seven or eight decades now, um, because we found that, that in, most, uh, in some circumstances, chemotherapy and combination chemotherapy can be quite effective. But if you look back in medical history toward the, for the beginning of 20th century, before the advent of chemotherapy, there really um, were two uh, therapeutic options for people with cancer. One is surgery, and the second is radiation. This is uh, in, in the dawn of the radiation uh, physics uh, era. Um, but if you just trace back a little bit uh, past this whole past century where most of our efforts is really in tumor intrinsic vulnerabilities, meaning understanding what, what is it about the tumor cells itself that we can attack either by chemotherapy or radiation to induce cell death. Um, but before all these tumor intrinsic approaches to solving cancer, there was sort of a flash of hope in the late 19th century, beginning of 20th century, where um, there were brief demonstrations that immune system, our own immune system can be quite effective in fighting cancer. And this is sort of was attributed for the large part to Dr. Paul Ehrlich in 1909, who won the Nobel Prize in 1908. Uh, and and proposing, the proposal is that the tumor uh, can be effectively eliminated by the immune system. But the major demonstration clinically really was um, a product of Dr. Coley's work uh, in New York. And over the past century or 120 years, it really uh, uh, sort of, uh, we spent 120 years understanding some of the basic biology behind our own immune system to the point now uh, in the current decade, we're starting to be able to manipulate some of our understanding and translate it into a clinical translation to fight cancer. So it's a long road. And as I said, many of our, maybe up to this point, a lot of our, our conversations around osteosarcoma surrounds the traditional sort of chemo, uh, surgery, and some instances, radiation. And what I group these things are sort of tumor intrinsic uh, uh, properties of cancer, right? So we understand genetic alterations. We want to do the genomic profiling, epigenome, transcriptome, the, the DNA, RNA proteins that are made by the cancer cells that allow them to survive better and understand how can we attack their cell cycle by some of these chemotherapies so they will grow less. How do we have them turn over faster? Um, their metabolomic uh, profiles. How do we use our nutrients? What kind of food we eat? oxygen tension, all the other stuff to really cause stress in the cancer cells to cause them to die. But what I wanted to spend today really thinking about is a, a, a different way to approach the cancer, meaning cancer cells do not exist in, in a vacuum by itself, right? It exists in the, in the person body, which is surrounded by a whole bunch of other non-cancer cells immune system being one of them, but obviously they have vasculature, they have stromal cells, they have fibroblasts, they have other things, microbiome we heard a lot about recently, about bacteria in our gut, how they affect our body's uh, ability to fight cancer. So, so we want to sort of think a little bit about are there things in a non-cancer specific manner that we can manipulate to allow the immune system in this case to do a better job at eliminating cancer, which is overall, after all, part of the properties of the immune system is to detect anything that is different from self, right? So bacteria, uh, infections, COVID-19, I mean, as a perfect example, something that, that shouldn't be in the body when it's introduced into the body, the immune system fights very aggressively against it. And for some reason, cancer cells are allowed to thrive even though they have all the genetic mutations which should make them not part of us. Um, and so the understanding this whole sort of cell versus non-self is where the immunotherapy comes in. And obviously we, we have a lot of excitements now, despite the evidence that, that uh, cancer grows in our body, 
there's actually the, the existence of immune system that can very effectively eliminate this cancer if we know how to get hold of it and, and how to manipulate it. And so, as I said, you know, when we use it in the right context, it can be very effective. But at the same time, the immune system is also very aggressive and very specific. So if you use, if you turn the immune system to fight against cancer that has a shared property with normal tissue, then you might actually have a potential side effect of immune system fighting against normal tissue and causing autoimmune diseases. And, and these are some of the things we're starting to see in our clinical practice with the more recent uh, immunotherapeutics such as CAR T cells and immune checkpoint blockades, um, things that have really made a lot of headlines. So we are really scratching the surface right now and hopefully in the next decade, this is really gonna be one of the major advancement points. And obviously immunotherapy is very exciting, not just because of its own sort of very powerful um, uh, way to fight cancer, it can be universal sometimes. Um, this is why you, you see certain aspect of immune therapy, people, when, when you develop immunotherapy against melanoma, for example, it may actually the same principle and the same drug can be used to fight against osteosarcoma. So we always have to keep our eyes open to see what is out there um, that people are using in different kinds of histology of cancer and does it make sense for us to apply the same thing into, uh, into therapy for, for osteosarcoma. And because immune systems are either composed of cells that can move around in your body, or proteins that can float around in lymphatics and blood, it can actually penetrate through the whole body. And so they can go to places where potentially radiation, surgeon's hands, and even some chemotherapeutic agents cannot penetrate. And it has a specific memory response uh, in, in certain part of the immune system. So that even if you, cancers are in very low abundance and you're not, it's not being eliminated, um, but at some point in the future, there is at least theoretic hope that the immune system can remember itself and they remember the encounter of the same antigens or the same proteins uh, that's ex expressed on a tumor. And so if there's a reemergence of a tumor expressing the same thing down the future, your immune system can be woken up and, and targeted. So obviously we're talking about osteosarcoma here. Uh, and I want to focus specifically on the tumor that they metastasize to the lungs. Um, and just so that you know, you know, I think every tissue in your body where the tumors reside will present different in the uh, tissue context. And I think the more we understand about different tissue context, what are the cells uh, that are in the lungs, for example, versus the bones, versus the brain, versus wherever, I think that the more we're gonna understand and the, the better we're gonna be effectively targeting. So if you look under a microscope, um, and you, you say, okay, so here's the biopsy of an osteosarcoma. Most of the time, many of the cells we see under microscope are the tumor cells. And that's depicted here by these pink cells. Some tumor cells are dividing. You see this chromosome, uh, chromatins being split into two daughter cells. And we are constantly thinking about ways to use chemotherapy to, to target these dividing cells so they don't grow anymore. But if you step back and look at the 30,000 foot level, the whole tissue that composed the tumor actually are also composed of multiple different other cell types, such as, such as all the immune cells that we have. Um, we don't have time to talk about specifically each one of them, but these cells also play a role in the tumor microenvironment. And in many times, they are playing a role in containing the tumor. Sometimes they're playing a role to allow the tumor to grow. Sometimes they're actively fighting against the tumor, but there are multiple mechanisms. There's a push and pull uh, relationship and that, that keeps the tumor either at bay or the immune system then all of a sudden collapses and the tumor takes over. Um, so there are constant interactions going on here and this is our job to try to figure out what are these communication codes that we can hopefully hijack at some point and, and use them against the tumor cells. So I'll focus a couple of things today. One is we recently uh, focused on a, a specific molecule called VCAM1, which is found to be overexpressed in osteosarcoma cells that specifically metastasize to the lungs. Um, and we know that vcam ones partner on the neighboring cell here in green um, is this molecule called v, uh, VLA4, alpha-4 beta-1 integrin. The, the, the name is not important, but the important thing is to understand that in order for this osteosarcoma tumor cells to grow in the lungs, they need these neighboring macrophages to create a nest to allow them to take hold 
and to grow. And sort of like, you know, having a bully, and every time you see a bully in school, they're always surrounded by a couple other sort of not so bully bullies, right? And, and they, there's, a, you know, there's a relationship here that, that allows this whole thing to, to then becomes a micro environment where even if you have a very effective, let's say, CAR T cell, for example, you want to create a CAR T cell to come in to destroy the tumor, but if the whole environment is so immunosuppressive, even the effective CAR T cell may not work properly. So, and, and there are other molecules I'll mention briefly. This is why we have to continue to understand this. One of the things that, uh, and this might have already been mentioned, um, pediatric cancer is very different than adult cancers. And this is just an exa example of looking at the types of immune cells that are infiltrating in different tumors. And these are a lot of histology here, breast and colon, obviously a majority uh, are, are in uh, adult cancers, esophagus cancer, uh, versus Ewing's osteoraptor, neuro, uh, neuroblastoma, hepatoblastoma, and Wilms. These are all very pediatric uh, cancers. And what we can see right off the bat between adults and peds, there are differences in the amount of immune cells that infiltrate into these tumors, okay? So uh, whereas adults, they are heavily infiltrated for the most part, by T cells, and these are denoted by CD3. T cells is a, a kind of lymphocyte uh, in your body. But uh, in pediatric tumors, they are infiltrated predominantly by myeloid cells, or these CD68 positive cells, the macrophages and myeloid suppressor cells. And the question is, what do these cells do? And Dr. Gorlick and MD Anderson actually had a, um, a nice paper a while back now looking at osteosarcoma patients and comparing the abundance of these macrophages, these myeloid cells and look at the overall outcome, the more myeloid cell infiltration you have, or another type of, type of myeloid cells, the, the dendritic cells, the more you have in the tumor itself, the worse clinical outcome you have, suggesting that the, the presence of these myeloid cells are doing something bad for, the, for you, okay? And they are favoring the tumor development. And so we wanted to look a little bit about that, and this is the project that's funded by um, MIB agent. Um, and, and this is, this is um, the, the first part here where we take this sort of this um, understanding and develop a, a, a uh, therapeutics around targeting this, this VCAM1, VLA4 interactions into a clinical trial. And, and this is what depicted here by this picture. Um, I'll show you just very briefly. Um, this is actually not specific only to osteosarcoma, but in breast cancer, for example, in cervical cancer, in a couple other cancers, it's been shown that from the primary tumor, you can have tumors that spread through the blood vessels and seed it in the lungs or in the bones. In this case, this is breast cancer. For whatever reason, the tumors that they took residence in the lung or in the bone overexpress on their surface this VCAM1 molecule. And, and there's a lot of studies undergoing right now understanding that on a genetic level, why that is. But what is shown is that when this VCAM1 on the tumor interacts with neighboring myeloid cells, these macrophages, um, they induce a survival signal into the tumor to allow tumors to grow, all right? And what we found was, oops, this is, uh, um, what we found also through our study is that this interaction not only has a positive effect to allow tumor to grow, but it also sends another signal into the macrophage to, uh, cells itself to make these macrophage uh, act as if they are suppressing the immune system. So there is a, a bilateral talk between these two. And the, the idea was if you disrupt this interaction, can you change, number one, the pro-survival signal in the tumor, and number two, change these macrophages into another type of macrophages that are usually seen in inflammation, in fighting bacteria, fighting um, other infectious agents, so that they can then help in eliminating the tumor. And that's the idea. And, and so, we, we did a couple of experiments to show whether macrophages, in fact, is needed for the tumor to grow in the lungs. Um, and this is a very busy slide, but suffice it to say that what we found was if you inject tumors into the leg of an animal and perform amputation at a time when we know there's seeding of the tumor in the lungs, um, so you remove the primary tumor and much like our clinical scenario where you know you have metastatic disease in the lungs. And then we give them chemicals that actually will deplete the macrophages in the lung. So to take away these supportive bully cells, cell types and ask what happened to the tumor itself, where, the, where this chemical does not have any direct effect on the tumor cells. What we saw was that over time, you see diminishment 
all the signals of the, the burdens of tumors in the lungs very effectively, actually. Um, and, uh, and so we took this further to say, okay, obviously we need these immune cells in the lungs to protect us from daily sort of exposure to bacteria and fungus and all the other stuff. We don't want to be going around depleting everybody's macrophages, but can we do something else different? And which is, uh, can we somehow specifically disrupt this crosstalk using molecules that specifically are targeting these interactions between the two molecules here? And so one of them is an antibody that targets against this alpha-4 integrin uh, right at this junction between VKM1 and alpha-4. And this is a, a commercially FDA-approved drug that uh, people using in MS, um, uh, natalizumab or tasabri, where uh, it's been shown to be actually pretty effective uh, in patients with MS to prevent cells from um, migrating into the CNS. And what we found was that um, very effectively, we can actually eliminate tumors that have already occurred in the lungs using these kinds of methods, using antibody against this alpha-4 antibody, um, and to, to actually induce quite a substantial number of mice to become tumor-free, as far as we can understand. Um, so again, there's nothing here targeting directly at the tumor. All we are doing is we're taking away the crosstalk between the tumor and the myeloid cells, okay? Um, and so based on that, we, uh, and I'll, I'll skip over this, based on that, we, we have been pursuing this now for the last year and a half, a, um, a phase one, two clinical trial, where we propose to Biogen, who owns the um, natalizumab drug, which is, again, like I said, approved for autoimmune diseases, MS and IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, and really show them all the data we have. And for the past year and a half, we we open our books and show them all the preclinical data we have. And part of the study was supported by the MIB uh, Agent Ausparting Osteosarcoma Fund. And um, we were able to finally sort of convince them uh, over the last, uh, in December, to allow us to use their drug um, and to, to start a clinical trial, hopefully soon, where we were looking at, number one, safety of the drug in pediatric population. Again, that drug is mostly approved for adult patients with uh, MS. And there's some small uh, cohort of um, safety data in pediatrics in Europe and other places. Uh, but we wanted to do a sort of phase one, two. So in phase one, we're looking at dose escalation safety data to make sure people can tolerate. Uh, we can reach a, a maximum dose of adult dosing that will be safe for children. Um, and then hopefully we'll see some responses in patients who have unresectable. So these are pulmonary nodules that the surgeon's hands cannot reach, and to, for whom there's no other option, to see whether or not we can actually see any clinical response whatsoever. Now, obviously, I think ultimately, single agent like this probably are not going to work as effectively as combination with other things. But before we can get there, we need to have a safety profile of this drug in pediatric populations so we can actually, the age range we have here is quite large between 5 and 30. Right. And, and some people have asked, why don't we open up to 40 or 50 years old, um, which is great. And, and but what I'm afraid of, again, here, the main issue here is we want to have a safety demonstration in pediatric population. If we open to all the adult patients, we might dilute our numbers to the point where we don't have enough safety data for pediatric, and that's sort of defeating the whole purpose. Um, but this is now going on for, and these, these are some of the inclusion criterias. Um, and and uh, we have a pretty wide range of patients. Uh, they are allowed to be on this. And this is already listed on um, clinicaltrials.gov. And here's an email that every investigator wanted to receive. This is an email from Biogen saying, and Dr. Von Hayes, I don't know if she's on the call or not. Uh, she's the one that actually worked on this clinical trial uh, contract uh, concept and design. Um, and they say they, they are on board with this. And the last thing we know uh, before the whole COVID-19 hits is that we are in contract negotiation with them. And uh, just uh, last week, I sent again, and I think the, the, the lawyers are talking. So we're hopeful that this will be um, uh, ongoing soon. And then very quickly, the, the last few minutes is some of the things that are coming on board. Uh, what else are we thinking about? Obviously, the, the antibody, not just targeting um, you know, the alpha-4 integrin on myeloid cells in our lungs, but the, the same alpha-4 integrin is expressed in, in many, many other cells in, in your body, like mostly immune cells. And so this is not something that will be very specific. Um, and uh, so we are developing new things. One of the, the new agent is actually um, a, a compound that's being worked on by Dr. Mei Zhang, my collaborator, 
who is a biomedical engineer at Case. And um, we found out that the outer shell of oat, the oatmeal that you have, the outer shell of oat actually has a, a structure, uh, a beta glucan or sugar molecule, we call it BG34. It's a very specific isolate from the natural occurring oat, which has a very potent immune stimulatory effect if you give it IV. Now, obviously, if you take it orally, it will benefit you, you know, lose weight and all kinds of stuff. It's great. Um, and, and, you know, you can change your microbiota, you know, all that kind of stuff that people you hear about uh, Quaker Oats commercials on TV. But what we found was if you give it IV, it's a very specific role in activating these myeloid cells in your body. And they will turn these myeloid cells from a, a tumor tolerant phenotype into something that is very active against tumor cells. And we are still working on the, the um, all the mechanisms of how this works. But we, you know, we have the IP, we, we are now performing, or we just submitted a pre-IND um, submission or about to submit a pre-IND request with, with the FDA for potential phase one clinical trial in osteosarcoma uh, to try this in, in again, unresectable patient population um, that, that uh, to hopefully see some activity there. But we're also in conversation with the NCI to possibly uh, perform uh, a canine trial of osteosarcoma for safety data. And that will actually boost our uh, you know, ultimate filing with the FDA if we have some safety data with the dog. Um, so this is, again, uh, just the concept where this, this BG34 can be taken up into these macrophages and it turns the macrophage into a very angry looking macrophage that ultimately attract all the other immune cells into the tumor microenvironment and kill the, uh, the cancer cells. And then we have already demonstrated this in publications where we're using mouse models of osteosarcoma. When we start in injecting this BG34, which are very well tolerated actually by the animals, over a span of two months, we can render a substantial number of these animals tumor free in the lungs. And this is not just working in osteosarcoma, but also in melanoma as well. So this is something that we're very excited about uh, and the mechanism is very unique. And here it's just a, a trial concept for a canine trial using BG34. And I just had a conversation this morning with Dr. Amy LeBlanc at NCI uh, over email about you know, updating her on where we are right now on this. And so, so be on the lookout for this. And then the third thing, lastly, is um, targeting another molecule in the tumor microenvironment where osteosarcoma lives, and that is TGF-beta. This is a small molecule that's very abundant uh, in any tissue in your body, when, especially when you have tissue repair. And, and, um, and if you hear this, this sort of terminology, you know, cancer is a tissue, the wound that doesn't heal. Um, and so, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a, a smoldering um, pro process of cancer causing inflammation and there's tissue repair. So TGF beta is very abundant in that microenvironment. TGF beta turns out is very immune um, suppressive, okay? Um, we have been able to partner with um, Epecto, which is a company based in, in South Korea. They have developed a small molecule which is orally available. So something that you can take in by mouth, you will go into your system, you neutralize the receptor for this TGF beta, but within eight, 12 hours, this, the, the effect will go away. So you can actually have a washout phase, uh, which is you can titrate the effect of the drug very effectively by, by modulating your oral intake. That's very different than the traditional antibody-based approach to TGF-beta, which is, has a very long, long half-life. And once you take it, you know, if you have side effects, it's really hard to get rid of. Um, but we're very optimistic about this orally available small molecule that's already now in clinical trial in multiple myeloma, pancreatic cancer, a whole bunch of other things. And we've gotten the, um, the company to be very interested in, in trying in osteosarcoma. And just to show you, this is TGF beta, uh, just one, one ex couple of experiments here is mouse models of osteosarcoma in the lungs, where if you don't do anything to progress over time, and here's mouse, they're fed orally. With this, uh, with this powder, this PGF, uh, TGF beta inhibitor, um, over and now I think the latest number I saw is 100 days, um, and this is this is achievable dosing that we can use in patients, and we're very uh, excited to hopefully bring this on board soon. So that's just a, a snapshot of some of the things that are happening in the lab. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more to do, but we first thing first, we're very excited about uh, potentially getting the approval for FDA IND with the uh, integrin blockade. 
and the second is to continue to develop this BG34 compound as a small molecule activator of the immune system, and then continue to have conversation with the company about the small molecule TGF-beta inhibitor. Um, there are a couple other things uh, they are on, on the docket that probably very much uh, premature to talk about, but um, just the last slide, and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up here. Um, but one of the things that I th I'm, I'm very excited about this actually, is I don't know if people heard about this whole concept of cryoablation, which is, you know, obviously you can shrink a bulky tumor by either uh, heat it up, right? Or you can zap it with radiation, or one of the ways you can do it is you can insert a probe and put very cold temperature, either, or either argon gas or liquid nitrogen to freeze and to cause a, a crystal water crystal. And that what, what it does is it, it disrupts the tumor cells and it releases all kinds of tumor antigens and other things that are very immune stimulatory. And what we have been able to work on is principally in a um, mouse model of rhabdomyosarcoma is that we are beginning to understand a, li a little bit more about the molecular undertaking behind this type of approach and what are needed as a biomarker before we enroll patients to try on the cryoablation. The idea was that if you can activate the immune system effectively, the immune system can actually go and attack other metastatic sites other than the ones that you actually you stick a probe in. So there's something called a SCOBO effect, where if you uh, target one lesion, there might be multiple other lesions in the body which can be attacked by the activated immune system that circulates through your body, which obviously will be ideal. Um, and, um, and so there's something that we are very interested in. And, uh, hopefully there are a couple of grants out there pending right now to actually sustain this work. But again, this is something that it was started with the help of uh, MIB agents funding. And um, so I will end there. Um, and uh, I think leaving, hopefully, sorry, I went over time, three minutes. Um, but uh, thank you all very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, that was awesome. <laughs> Um, I think I, I think everybody must be standing up and cheering right now because that was amazing. I there's so much there to to um, take in and um, you know for for families that are in treatment right now or who are newly diagnosed, this is so hopeful. There's so much there's so much on your plate over there at uh, at Case. And uh, UH Rainbow Babies, that that are just is is really hopeful. So thank you for undertaking that work. How important is funding from nonprofits or private funding? How important is that to your work? Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's the fundamental um, the fundamental advantage and, and the criti critical support of foundation funding such as the MIB agent is to allow, um, especially if, if it's discretionary funding, where it's not tied to a, a specific, I mean, I think I understand there's the importance of milestone delivery, but I think there are certain times when um, you want to be nimble and be able to move in a direction which might be 180 degrees different than what you originally proposed in the traditional funding model where we go to NIH or Department of Defense. We, we come in with uh, a lot of established data. We know, pretty much know what the outcome is gonna be, right? I mean, we're proposing things that is very safe. Um, to me, that there's, there's a certain, um, you know, certain need for that. I mean, I, I think you, you, we need to push that and, and ultimately everything that we do ultimately will end up on that. But in the early development of any concepts, especially for people like me, a little ADHD when it comes to ideas, <laughs> um, just so, you know, a lot of times we might start out with one idea, but as, as knowledge grow, as we read different things, as you know, I mentioned about cryoablation, for example, or, or TGF beta, you know, when a, I didn't know there were people out there developing small molecules for TGF beta, it was brought to my attention. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, that, that can be very useful in osteosarcoma. So having, having funding that says, okay, I, before I can go up against the big boys and girls at the NIH level, uh, I need to have some preliminary data that will assure me that, that I can go from a high risk, high reward 
to a low risk, high reward situation. And that conversation happens very quickly when we have the availability of fundings like MIB agents to then do that. Um, and also, you know, sometimes it, it, the other thing is having funding like this, we get, I can't tell you how many exciting discoveries were made because we happen to have a summer student that comes in or a graduate student that do rotations, or they do a project where in the back of your mind, you said, there's no way this is gonna work. <laughs> and you are, you're a little embarrassed to put it in a, in a grant because you know your peer is gonna look at it at the NIH level and so say, you're out of your mind. But, but, but the funding like this allow things to sort of smolder in the background until all of a sudden, you know, you, one day you open your email, you say, what, you've done this, you didn't tell me. And there's a whole bunch of excitement. And, and, you know, the cryoablation is an example. Um, and so, so again, this, this, these partnerships between, um, between the investigators and the foundation is, is critical, is critical. And, and I can't tell you, um, they're, they're also, you know, the other aspect of, of foundation funding is the way they develop someone's career, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, the hidden secret in, in, um, in research is that you go where the money is. Right, so so we see this uh, like real time right now, right? So so there's a lot of money in COVID nineteen, and and if you if you don't if you don't have a sort of you know dedicated passion for a certain disease, you know you have to survive somehow, and all of a sudden you're off to doing COVID nineteen. Now, of course, there, there might in the future might be things we can get uh, out of COVID nineteen knowledge we can use to come back and and fight against the osteosarcoma. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, the whole COVID-19 thing on myeloid cells, I think will be an interesting topic. But, you know, I, I, I think, I think we, we go where the money is. And, and so, so having sort of a foundation support allows us the assurance that we, we have the funding necessary to keep going, even if there are gaps in funding. And, and, and like I said, to be able to say, okay, I'm going to mobilize, you know, for the next two weeks, two months, I'm going to do this rather than doing what I said I was going to do and because this is where the science is, is hot, we got to go after it. Just, it's, it's critical. And I, I don't know how, how much better I can say about that, but. Um, yeah. yeah, I didn't realize as a patient how, how essential private or nonprofit based funding is to a researcher. I didn't, I didn't know that that, that that was so important, part one and part two. I didn't realize when we started fund when we started funding research um, before we started funding research as MIB, looking into research projects. So many times, the research project was just about funding a summer intern or or funding a, a lab assistant, and it seemed, gosh, it seems so simple just to have one more person in the lab that's that's running different tests so that the PI can work on what's essential right in front of them. The other aspect about having a relationship with, with you know, uh, patient organizations or, or foundations is, I think it always is helpful to have a personal connection, um, yeah. you know, so that, so that I, I, I think one of the danger that, that academia has is that we can study a process to death. Uh, we can understand, you know, the details down to the angstroms of how molecules work. Uh, and sometimes we lost the forest for the trees. And, and, but by having connections with foundations such as MIB um, really sort of puts a human face on it. And, and it, it sort of reminds folks in the lab as they work daily, they, they understand that there is a, is this is beyond intellectual curiosity. There, there yeah. obviously intellectual curiosity is important, but we're constantly thinking about translation ability or, or thinking about okay, what, what is the, low, the least lowest lying fruit that we can go after, that we can see on the clinical side? And, you know, that, that Johnny and Jenny can actually, you know, benefit from this across the street. And, but, but it also it's involving a lot of education, not just about with, with foundations and, and patient advocacy, what, what is realistic, what is not realistic. But at the same time, it also in, includes communications with our clinical colleagues and to convince them Sometimes it's harder to convince our clinical colleagues than foundations that's, that we're onto something because we're all fixing you know, a particular way of thinking and, and change is hard. And so, you know, I think one of the things as a community of pediatric oncologists in the future is 
you know, and everyone's struggling with this. How, how, do you, how do you go between established standard of care, let's say for osteo, right? How do you, how do you do that up from MAP therapy or VPI fast or something that we, we're so sort of holding onto it? And when is it good enough for immunotherapeutics to say, would you dare to try that up front? Or do you do it at the first moment you realize it's not working? Or do you do it, you know, when it's MIC amplification? Or if, you're, if your necrosis is less than 90%, you jump on it? Or you have, you know, metastatic disease up front? What is it? When do we do it? How do we do it? So that we don't shoot, shoot ourselves in the foot uh, when it comes to immune therapy and they don't jive very well with chemo. Um, so, you know, I think these are the challenges we have and, and we, just, we just need to be sort of all hands on deck to think about how do we how do, we do this collectively, especially in a, in a disease where you don't have that many cases in the country and you can't afford to have 15 different trials that at the end, you know, you end up with, you know, three or four patients per trial and you never achieve a statistical um, thing. So I can assure you that there's actually on the, on the COG level, I mean, there are a lot of conversations about Oh, what are the next agents to bring on board, um, and how do you evaluate that? Um, you know, it, it, especially when it comes to immunotherapy, where um, a mouse immune system is very different than human, but we can do a lot of experimentations in human to understand the immune system. So, you know, what are the best models to use? How what's the critical threshold um, above which we said, okay, we, it's a go uh, versus no go? So, you know, my approach is always. I look at if there are principal things we can do, and you look around and say, what are the drugs that's already out there that's relatively safe and benign? And if it makes sense in osteo and we can demonstrate it in some form or fashion that is efficacious, is that enough to push and say, let's, let's go, you know, let's give it a shot. So it's an interesting question. Okay, we have two. We have two quick questions, and since we since we're going we're going a little bit long, so we're calling it the bonus round. So yeah. we'll go we'll go for another 10, 15 minutes, and right. um, I, I got to start eating my um, your snack, your yeah. rice krispie treat. <laughs> um, I brought strawberries, which is totally different from my usual Pepperidge Farm, which <laughs> should be much better. Anyway, um, Amanda, you have a question? I do. Are any of the projects that are in existence now or upcoming projects, will they be tailored to, for the child who has already researched surgical NED but has relapsed many times? Yeah, so that's... Yeah, so so the, the patient the patient selection for a particular trial, I think it's going to evolve over time. Um, for, for the natalizumab trial, uh, because we are, our principle is to to actually introduce first of all to get the company interested in cancer, secondly to actually introduce some safety profile in pediatrics so that we can actually then design further experiments at different patient selections. That's why we pick unresectable patients to begin with, um, and that's. A lot of times, you know, when you have a first in man trial, that's usually what people do. Now, there are, like, for example, the, the T, uh, TGF beta small molecule inhibitor, we already have some data in clinical phase one trial in patients with other cancers. You know, the concept we are thinking about right now is actually to have it either as an as a orally available agent that you take when you have post resection um, and just follow to see, you know, is there, is there a, any change to potential local relapse or, or distant metastasis or whatnot? Or have upfront treatment of the patient who have resectable uh, lesions, but have a window where we, they are exposed to the drug so that after the exposure, they can go to the OR, have the tissue resected, and they give us the tissue to, to hopefully understand a little bit better, are we doing anything different in that tumor microenvironment in the lungs compared to controls. So there, there are patients, obviously, as we think about the design and what kind of scientific answer or, or lessons we can learn, we'll start to pick different disease populations, um, uh, patients with, with different disease, um, and, 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 and go from there. Um, I don't think right now what we're doing, any of it will, will go you know, until you have gone through the standard of 
care, you know, the whole trial and, 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 and to have, you know, the relapse um, or, or recurrence. And the question is how fast after relapse recurrence, especially, you know, if there are other TKI inhibitors, there are other whole bunch of other different things to try, how do you, how do you judge a patient what is right for that patient or not? Um, and this is why I'm, I'm interested in developing you know, sort of biomarkers to, to at least you know, for something like cryotherapy, for example, if there is a clear cut biomarker that tells us somebody's gonna benefit from this versus somebody who's not gonna benefit, then, then you will help us sort of narrow, narrow down selection patients. Um, but it's a, it's a conversation you gotta have with your, with your oncologist uh, about what, you know, what are the trials that, that's most, that makes most sense for you. Okay, question from a parent. In doing my research as a parent and in talk, um, talking with several doctors, it seems like many trials and research is focused on non-resectable tumors. Just curious why more research trials aren't being done for tumors which are resectable. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand the need if an agent is working against a tumor, tumor but it seems like so many patients get lung mets uh, one or several times and have surgery and then a period of remission and then the nodules pop back up. Yeah, so that was sort of similar to Amanda's question. I think, um, you know, I think, I think the reason is that um, we know in specifically in osteosarcoma and pulmonary metastasis, we know, you know, just cherry picking as, as, as the surgeons like to say, right? Uh, surgical resection can, is effective, um, you know, in, in getting rid of whatever lesions they are present on the CT scan or they can feel by fingertips. Um, and that's why, you know, this is, this is what goes back to what I was saying before. I think the challenge, it will be uh, as we develop newer and newer agents, when do you decide that this newer agent is better than the traditionally established protocol, right? So, you know, if, if the, the history of treating disease is that we can render some patients with metastatic lung lesions more or less tumor free for some period of time by aggressive surgery, are we, are we as, as a community ready to say, we're re we, we are willing to take that risk of having these lesions grow and trying new agents uh, to the point where potentially the lesion might grow so big they becomes unresectable, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of those conversations. Um, what, are we, what are we feeling comfortable about? And, um, and that's why I said this will be an ongoing conversation across the board. Okay. Next question, if BG34-200 trial shows promise in the canine trial, what are the next steps and timeline for advancing to human trial? Yeah. And what are the next steps timeline for further studying the Vactoceratib? Yes. Yeah. Uh, both of them, I, I want to be very uh, optimistic. <laughs> for the BG34, as I mentioned, we, we are ready to submit the preclinical a pre-IND meeting request with the FDA. This is specifically for human phase one. Now, at the same time, we're preparing for a canine trial. The outcome of the canine trial um, is, is not, I mean, we wanna do both, um, but our ability to file with the FDA is not predicated on completing the canine trial. We're doing the canine trial just in case that uh, FDA is asking us, because this is first in man agent, are they, if they're asking us to look at, to show efficacy data in two mammals, one being mouse, you know, and, and for osteo, I think that the canine will be the, the best um, scenario. Um, we're trying to be preemptively uh, proactive about that. Um, so it's possible that we are gonna have our IND meeting with the FDA later this, uh, hopefully this summer. And they might say, what are, for whatever data we already have in mouse is good enough to go. Especially if, depending on what we propose, if we say we're gonna try first in non-resectable uh, non osteosarcoma for whom there's no SOP or standard of care, mm -hmm. um, they might say that that's a population that's entirely appropriate, it's a go. Then, then really the thing that's holding us back is a GMP production of this, this BG34 molecule we would just look into it. It co you know, costs a couple hundred thousand dollars, no big deal. Um, and, and, the, and the cost of a clinical trial, which you know, obviously will go in and aggressively go after funding for that. Um, but you know, within a two year period um, is, is what we're thinking for a clinical trial with BG34. 
in TEW, the, the company actually has been very interested in this. Um, we are about to send them our set of preclinical data in mouse. Um, and I don't want to speak for them, but it's one of those situations where wink, wink kind of thing. If it works, um, they're willing to sponsor the whole trial in osteo. Um, and I think obviously for them, the advantage is potentially the compound, you know, if they, if they target rare disease, orphan, orphan cancer designation, it might move faster to FDA approval and they can always come back and use it in other cancer indications. So we're trying to leverage anything we have <laughs> to, to get the company interested. And the thing that helps us is that we, we know the scientific advisor um, for the company who we used to work at NCI. So it's good to have friends in different yeah. places. So. Well, you have friends at MIB too. So if we can Excellent. help, <laughs> we're, we're about it. We're, we're about it. We've got to move this thing forward with 40 year old treatments. Um, in my case, it worked. In Amanda's case, it worked. But there are too many for whom it does not work. And we just, we have to do better. I'm so excited to have you on board today, uh, Dr. Wang. It's been always a, a pleasure this time and, and every other time we've, we've had you speak at, at Factor and, and coming to visit you at your lab and in your, in your hospital. It's been just really, come, really come again anytime. Exciting. You know. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm coming again. This, this social distancing <laughs> is killing me. So, I know. So, I know. Point, anybody's welcome. So. Yeah, great. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you very much um, for all the work that you do on behalf of osteosarcoma patients, Amanda and Florencia. Thank you. Um, next week, we have Dr. Andy Livingston, who is also an Outsmarting Osteosarcoma winner for 2020. He'll be talking about his MIB funded research, CD73, the next immunotherapy target in osteosarcoma. Um, so please join us for that. It's gonna be another cool session. The sessions on, on podcast and, webs and uh, video are available on our website. When you go to our website, there's a blue bar at the top, just click that and you have access to this and, and past presentations as well as registration for future. Um, thanks again for joining us, Dr. Wang, and of course, Amanda and Florencia. Stay safe, everyone. If MIB can be of help to you, please let us know. Together, we make it better for osteosarcoma kids everywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Join us next week when we talk to Dr. Andy Livingston of MD Anderson. The following week, we'll be with Dr. Matteo Truco of Cleveland Clinic, and then May 28th with Dr. Josh Schiffman of Huntsman Cancer Institute. Those researchers will be talking about their MIB agents funded research. More information at mibagents.org.